life is a mess and you're totally stressed out, just call Trent. Just call Trent. When your wife is cold as ice and you need some advice, just call Trent. Just call Trent. He'll shoot it straight and he won't say no. He'll just give you that advice and say, well, there you go. Thanks for doing this, Tom. Um, hey, thank you, Trent, for asking me. Yeah, it's I really thrill. appreciate it. It's a thrill to do a podcast with a guy with a name like Trent. What's Marbury? Trent Marbury, right? <laughs> May Mabry. Mabry, like Mayberry. Yeah, a That's little all. bit. Yeah. Mabry, detective. Exactly. I mean, it's perfect noir. It's so noir. <laughs> Mabry noir, Steve. All right. Exactly. Yeah. Close. Great. Close enough. I wish I had a name like that. <laughs> no, I like Tom Leopold. That's a good name, yeah. too. Yeah, it's all right. So, where'd you grow up? Um, I grew up in Miami. I grew up in, in Coral Gables, right in Miami, South Miami. Mm -hmm. Born down there. So strange to be from there. Well, people yeah. used to think it's stranger than maybe they do now, because you know what's strange now, you know. Exactly. Where's the barometer, you know? <laughs> uh, but you know, it's like growing up in the tropics. You know, it's hot, horribly hot. Yeah. I had terrible asthma, so you know, people we have mango fights. <laughs> Walk to school. It was so hot all the time that my. Uh, by the time I left the house and got to the corner, my shirt would be so. Oh, really? Wow. When you go to school, and back in my day, 1941, <laughs> no, they, no air con the school started to get air conditioned just as I was in high school. But they, mm -hmm. you think Miami, they would have would have been a law, which is why I can't read. <laughs> I can just write. I have to have well, that, that's yeah. all you really need. Yeah, yeah. And um, my mother kept the house so cold. It was freezing. It was just yeah. not, I mean, really. Um, we'd open the door on my other go, you're letting the cold out, you know. <laughs> so well, I'm in I'm in New York right now. There, you know, there's no I gotta have an air conditioner in, but the 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 heat's on right now and I you can't control that either. So it's, it's oh, oh, yeah, steaming, yeah, yeah. steaming hot in my room. <laughs> well, I live there too. Out we're out here in Connecticut. I have I have many home, you know, I, I keep rooms in a lot every state. <laughs> in case my train, my plane gets, you know, delayed or something. Yeah. No, no, not really. Not every. <laughs> yeah. So I grew up down in Miami, and I, I I came up to acting school when I was seventeen. But then I want to hear the rest about you, the rest of the show. All right. Yeah. Well, oh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> we'll get to yeah, me. Sure. Yeah. But uh, yeah. But. Uh, so you, we'll yeah, you wanted to be. An... <laughs> sorry. Go ahead. You wanted to be an actor. Yeah, before, yeah. before you realized you wanted you got into the comedy writing and stuff, right? Comedy writing just was kind of accidental but yeah well you know you think i want to go with you just figure you just go be an actor i mean i wanted to be in showbiz mm -hmm. i really wanted since i was like seven just to be in that magical tv part of it or movies or you know i just so you figure actor i don't know i'm gonna be a cinematographer i didn't even know what that was or anything right. but no so yeah and i did school plays and all that stuff in local theater and mm -hmm. And then I auditioned for NYU's acting program. They just had started making this acting program. And they were pulling kids from college kids from uh, Carnegie Tech, it was called. And now it's Carnegie Mellon. Or, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And that's where I'm. Uh, so I was 17. And I went up and auditioned and got in. And, and I went to New York at 17 and started acting school. And really, it was just this place on 2nd Avenue with juggling it, you know acting school you know right. but it was right at the time i mean it was i'd never really been away from home mm -hmm. really I was so nervous you know it's the hit, height of the hippie thing it was 67 so I mean, it's really like as soon as i put my bags down I said, we got to go up to columbia and throw the dean out of a window you know? <laughs> like, what what do you, you know right Stop. You know, I'm happy with the dean. I wasn't going there, but so anyway, <laughs> that's where I met. Like first day, I met Christopher Guest and Michael McKeon from mm -hmm. Spinal Tap and everything else. Yeah, a bunch of stuff. Yeah. So they were, had been to college already. They were 19, and I was just coming from high school. 
So that's a big difference, you know, at that age. Right. And I tell you, I, I and it sounds self-aggrandizing, uh, but if I don't aggrandize, I'll have to bring some people in. You know, uh, my <laughs> aggrandizer is, is, was deported. <laughs> but, but I hadn't realized how funny I had become from sitting in the, getting kicked out of class and being the class mm-hmm. and all that. Until I met these two guys, and we started, it was like a kind of a magical thing, you know? It's like right. musicians and all, oh, you know, the band, you know. And they were two years older, so. But I saw how funny they were, and I was making them laugh. Like, oh, God. Mm-hmm. Funny, you know? And um, so I've known those guys since then, you know? That's great. Yeah. So, yeah, and then the acting school. And... Um, Tell me when you want to go to another direction. Or... <laughs> sure. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you're you're doing the acting school, and then you were, you got yeah. on some TV shows. You got on Gunsmoke, and yeah. Well, I way ahead. Well, they wanted to hold me back at acting school, and I don't know if that's anyone's ever been threatened with that before me. <laughs> right. You know, it's like imagine having to, you know, and what has came up on my screen? Toilet teens. No, that's <laughs> well, that's an accident. Um, the they wanted to hold me back in acting school. They didn't think I was any good. Really? And, yeah, yeah. And I thought, what am I going to tell my father? You know, they're holding me back in acting. It's like being <laughs> held back. You know, <laughs> at like you know, I don't know what. Like, <laughs> but I said, you can't hold me back because I had been. I got an agent right away, and I got cast in. Uh, an off Broadway, an important off Broadway play at 19. Oh, really? Came kind of a sensation. Mm-hmm. So I said, You can't hold me back. I'm going to be opening at the Cherry Lane Theater. <laughs> you know, you know, and yeah. I've been really never been out of show business, never had a job really out of show business. And the writing thing all came about. Um, one day, Chris Guess says, Look, I, I know these guys in this magazine. And I met him, and they and they said if we had, you know could come up with an idea for this magazine, the National Lampoon, which of course was very mm. big, at time. right? You know, it was really a hip thing, and so he says, but you know, we got to do it together. I said, okay, so we, he, but he said, I said, well, well how much time? Is, well, no, we got to go up there now. <laughs> oh, okay. So on the subway, we made up this idea about a guy who go. We the total bullshit idea. We. Can I can I say bullshit? Oh yeah, go for it. All right, can I uh, can I say rhino clit? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you All can right, say anything know. you want. I want to know the parameters yeah. <laughs> where I can go. Um, so on the way up, we made this up this idea for a story called "You've Got to Believe Me," about a guy who goes to his home back to his hometown re- high school reunion, and everyone in, at the high school has legs of a gnat. You know, everybody in the town, his mother has gnat legs, and this great artist did a thing of a. Mm-hmm. A mother with an apron holding cookies with mat legs, you know, <laughs> ugly bug like legs. And uh, they liked it. Yeah. So we ended up started writing articles for the National Lampoon Magazine, 19, 20, you know. So so you went there, you pitched that to like Doug Kenny or? Well, Kenny and Henry Beard. Mm-hmm. Hey, well, Henry's still around. You know, these guys were all college graduates, you know, this is, you know, but um, they liked us. We liked them. And Henry Beard, Doug Kenny. Sean Kelly, who passed, Doug, his grave is here in Connecticut, another town. Oh, really? And I went and visited that. Yeah. Weird story. A friend of mine who is a, I wouldn't say, she's not a psychic, but she's very religious and very, in, in you know, like gets a lot of visitations from, mm-hmm. but not like, she's Catholic, so it's not like it's, you know, she's on, on planet Vortex or something like that. There is no planet vortex. <laughs> Play along. Play along with it. And uh, she said, I get and she's this oh, it's a long story, but it's a sort of a supernatural story if you want. Well, to no, I'm interested in hearing it. Okay, all right. You tell me now if it's going off the you know, when the quality gets really below a certain level. <laughs> give me one of these. I'll let, I'll, I'll I'll let you know. Yeah. All right, yeah, yeah. Don't let you know, give me like a sign, like a baseball. <laughs> a man, Give me this. Give me one. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now I totally forgot what I was going to say. Oh, my friend uh, who I met 
when I did, I ran this show in, in I worked in London a bunch and I ran this show in London and uh, I, her name is Mary uh, O'Regan and she wanted to interview me when I got over to London to do, to run this sitcom called My Family, which is a huge sitcom. And they had an American guy created it who I knew and mm -hmm. I came and ran it for a, a season or a series, they call it, they don't call it a season. Right. So eight, 12 shows, you know, it's great. Uh, the other stuff you do with, you know, 28 shows. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Living in a tunnel, <laughs> the writers, the actors, it's great life for actors. Sometimes. Right. You know, but anyway, um, yeah, she interviewed me and I just thought it was going to be some weird Irish lady for some little thing. But anyway, uh, I said, why did you pick me? She says, well, I, my friend was suicidal. And so I'd have to go over to her house every night. And every night we would watch Cheers, to, not Cheers, Seinfeld together. Mm -hmm. Cheers to, and I would see your name. And I, she's very devout Catholic, beautiful lady, good friend of ours. And she says, I started praying that you would convert to, to Catholicism. Because I figured, oh, everybody's going to be Jewish, right? <laughs> I, I said, yeah, right. You're right. And the joke is... Um, I had already converted to, from Judaism to Catholicism. Oh, really? Before she even, that's what I mean. She's like, like that, you know? Yeah. Totally, strangely, which is a whole other story of a kind of a supernatural order involving one of my children being ill and kind of a spiritual, super, little supernatural things began happening to me. And I was never deep, uh, very proud to be Jewish, still am. Mm -hmm. I mean, you really don't get funny enough if you're not you know it's just <laughs> of the wise but uh, how do you do go gentile comedy funny people is a whole other kind of thing though like <laughs> yeah my friend Chevy Chase is you know it's not a Jew you know right <laughs> waspy waspy funny guys it's a whole other thing you know yeah it's great that's why in it when you put together a room a comedy room you want all these different players like a shortstop you want people who can do what you can't do you know and have another air angle just whatever gets you to your car Earlier. Yeah, the earliest, yeah. Morning, right. So anyway, um, well, I was, anyway, the, the Doug Kenny thing came about. Uh, it was a big story in this big Catholic newspaper. And anyway, we became friends. And she called me and she was very plugged into the commander, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, she called me and she said, I keep having these weird experiences with Doug Kenny. Did you know him? I said, slightly. I mean, I worked for him. Mm -hmm. and I knew him slightly. I could say, hey, Doug, and he would say, right, busy, you know, whatever it is. But um, he says, well, I keep getting these things that he wants Chevy Chase to go to Harvard Square in Harvard and hear this chorus. It was on Christmas time. It'll really make Chevy feel better because they were. Yeah, they were very, better. very close. Yeah. I'm mean, sure you're, you and your, your audience probably you know, maybe knows all that old history and stuff. But I mean, that movie was pretty good about the. Uh, oh, yeah. Movie. Yeah. So I said, OK, I mean, I, I said, all right, I'll ask him. And he said, he's a good friend of mine. And, mm -hmm. and they said, no, but I told me the story. And they, they didn't go. But anyway, she said, I keep getting. So now Doug Kenny wants you to visit his grave. And uh, so it turns out he was just like a 10 minute drive from where we live. Oh, really? Yeah, and when I went over there, and I don't know. Interesting. You can cut a lot of this out. <laughs> no, I. No chapo, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? What? Well, yeah. <laughs> You're a little off the sides, my friend. Okay. <laughs> well, you well, mentioned whatever. Chevy Chase, who was one. Right? Well, yeah, that was very interesting. You mentioned Chevy Chase, who's one of my yeah. my comedy idols, one of my favorite. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah and he kind of gave you your first big writing job right yes he, he didn't he, well yeah it was the biggest writing job absolutely because he was the, just become the biggest star in the country like overnight mm -hmm. <clears throat> and um i don't mean to be boastful in these stories uh trent mabry no oh, boast away but that is really your name <laughs> trent mabry it's like a name you'd make up real quick <laughs> Get out of trouble. What's your name? Trent Mayberry. Mayberry. <laughs> anyway. 
Um, so yeah, about Chevy. Um, well, I met Chevy. This is, you know, we knew he knew Chris Gass because they had actually shared a rented a house together in L.A. Like before even when before Chevy got famous and right kind of this world. And we knew from the yeah, he, he all, did a little na- national Murray Murray and Harold Raymond and all the guys, you know. So anyway, I was at a Chris and I went to uh, Chris Gass and I went to a party after Saturday Night Live. You know, like this is the first season. Mm-hmm. It's all a big deal at Dan Aykroyd's uh, loft, and I'm sitting over the side and on a couch and I'm just having a drink. And Chevy Chase comes over, and by now he's the you know the hard thro- comedy heartthrob of America, right. Right? And handsome and real funny, and uh, sits next to me and he goes, he just waits a minute and he goes, I hear you're the funniest guy, and I said and I just took it in, you know, and I said, yeah. <laughs> I didn't try to be funny or anything. Yeah. I just, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, he thought that was hilarious. But I just said, yeah, yeah. Right. I mean, I'm not trying to, you know, I have to prove it. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and anyway, so a little while after that, I get a call. And I think this is a funny story. People seem to like it. Um, he, I get a call from him. He, Chevy Chase. He says, look, I got it. I, I'm leaving Saturday Night Live, and from then let me out. I have to write do a special, TV special. Mm-hmm. We called them in those days, just an hour comedy thing, right? One off, you know. But and I want you to write on it. But I only want you to write on it if what I heard you said to someone, you actually said. I said, okay, fair enough. What did I say? He said, well, I was I was doing a play in Boston, mm-hmm. and my friend. Chris's sister, actually, he's old, I've known since we were 14, wanted to come up and see, see me in the play and, and stay in my apartment that I had rented mm-hmm. up in Boston. You know? And I, she says, well, yeah. I, I said, great. She says, yeah, come on. Uh, I'll come too. I'll stay two or three days. I said, stay too. <laughs> and, yeah, it was pretty funny. I mean, yeah. I, he says, did you say that, Debbie? And I go, yeah. He goes, okay, so I want you to write on. And I ended up writing a, a good amount of it, plus being on a lot of it. With yeah. Him. Um, but I learned, and you're a comedy guy. Um, yeah. I looked, I've done my research, uh, <laughs> and maybe, maybe the meteor that is me, comedy <laughs> meteor, is me. the comedy meteor, ladies, you know. Um, <laughs> but I learned that was a very. I learned a lot from that, and, and uh, in that, especially later when I started doing all these sitcoms, and I was in charge, and I'd have to hire writers or you know, run a room or mm-hmm. you find that you don't have to go through the whole script, you know, you get a pile of spec scripts and, and all you need is like one thing, one joke. And right. Go, I see who this fucking guy is. Yeah. You know, what I mean? you know like exactly. I, uh, I remember going through the living room once when my daughters were watching a sitcom. It was, it was funny. And I forget what it was. Married with children, maybe or something. Mm-hmm. But, uh, I don't know. But, uh, I heard one joke as I'm passing by. And usually they're all terrible. Right? Yeah. There are most of them. And I stopped and go, oh, I just like that. Now, whoever wrote that joke, I'd like to know that guy or girl. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Now, I, I should know them if they're going to write a joke like that. Yeah, you know what I mean? absolutely. And it's funny, but anyway, but but I learned that from Chevy that that it's silly and funny, but it's but it does... It's not even that great a joke. It's just, it's an attitude, you know. Right, you can tell who the yeah. It was sarcastic attitude, and that's what Chevy was all about. You know? Right. Yeah, kind of impish, kind of hand, you know, funny. A Cary Grant that just would also just fall down and exactly, you know, yeah. Look at the camera lens and stuff. So I learned a lot. Of, that was an interesting, smart thing. Like you know, in other words, you you don't have to. Uh, Eat the entire garbage can. You know? Right. Yeah. You can. It's it's That's the right. same way in like stand up, where I'll yeah. see like a guy in a club, and you can tell by his first or second joke. Okay, right. this guy's got something or not. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes though, uh, years ago I was hanging out at Catch a Rising Star with Belzer and uh, Paul Schaefer, and I was my best dearest friend. Yeah. Um, You'd see these comics, and and really, we would just go to get high with Belzer, <laughs> with the owner of the place, 
smoke. And then only Belzer would MC. And Belzer was right. a stand-up comic, you know. He wasn't. Yeah, he's one guy. of the, the top guy. For munch. Him, yeah. He wasn't just Munch. I mean, yeah. You know, which is great that he was Munch. But um, so, but I would see him introduce people, and that's what, and and I'd see a couple of their lines. And then some nights that you would, this guy, that guy's not going anywhere. And then the next night you might see him another time. And oh, like everybody's yeah. got something. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Everybody's that's got true. something, and you might not see it. That night, especially because the young, you know, you guys are, it's a hard, hard ass job. Now, w w did you ever do stand up? Well, I, uh, I, I, Belzer, who, because he was in charge of Catch Rise Star, says, look, just do it. Come on, write some things and come on, and I'll just see if you want to do it. Mm -hmm. And I always kind of liked the idea of being, I mean, I would go act. I was still at this point going back and forth from acting to, I did all these gun smoking manics and all. Big parts and all these things, you know, right. Broadway, off Broadway and all that stuff. But um, I kind of started liking being that guy. You know, let if let Chevy Chase it. I don't. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I'd rather writing. I like ah, oh, this is really what I'm good at. Yeah, you know. And also, I, you know, there's something. There's a nice kind of pride in oh, you knocked it my line out of the park. You know, you can you can, you can listen. You know, so. Um, but I did put together some jokes and nobody laughed, but, really? they, but they paid full attention. Yeah. Like they didn't lose it. And I thought, you know, I, um, now, I mean, I would have learned quickly that I got to write every word of a really nice tight thing and make it look like I'm just fucking around. Mm -hmm. but I didn't, I didn't think that, I, you know, I, I wrote some jokes, you know, I said, ladies and gentlemen, my impression of Buddy Holly, Coming home after school. Hi, mom. I'm mom. I'm home. home, home. <laughs> I'm stupid. And they, you know, kind of like, yeah. And uh, I don't remember what else I did. Yeah. But I knew I could maybe be okay at it. Um, but I didn't trust that lifestyle. I mean, I didn't want to be there too. I was enough. There was you know, enough temptation around. And, right. You know, and. Uh, and I did kind of think I, really, I want to be, I don't mind being the guy behind the guy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I kind of like sense. that actually. Yeah. So how's Bell? You're still friends with Belzer? He's yeah. retired now, right? He's in France in Bozul. Oh, really? The last place we, anyone who knew Belzer in the old days, and I love him. <laughs> He's my family guy, Uncle Bells, my daughters grew up calling. Um, Last thing you'd think, place you'd think Belzer would end up in, not that he's ended up, you know, hopefully he'll come visit right. me, but a chateau in the, in the south of, in, not south France, but in, in France, in near Toulouse. It's gorgeous, like stone. I mean, you know, this is the guy going, doing Mick Jagger on acid. Yeah, Bob, Bob Dylan. Yeah, the acting thing came along. Yeah. Yeah. Bob Dylan's bar mitzvah tape. Yeah. Yeah. And that was what the one thing by going to see him introduce people. Because we didn't have to see his act. He just never <laughs> changed his act. He's right. a lazy fucking guy. <laughs> um, you know, but he was the genius introducing people and being sure. funny right like that. Yeah. He never would work hard enough on his act, you know. But but he was so such a funny guy doing that. That mm -hmm. was really what he was great at. Yeah. Um, he's a very, very interesting guy. Yeah, a very interesting guy. And uh I totally forget now where we what the point <laughs> Oh, I was just I was just asking how Bel Belzer was doing. Oh yeah. Um. So you when you're like, who else was around when you were like hanging out? Well, that's the thing. Like we were talking about. Um, I hear a joke, or you hear. Yeah, I'm sure you're the same when you said about the comic at the plays at the clubs and and um. Chris Guest said, you know, we were in L.A. and he said, you got to meet Belzer, and then put it together like a like a date, mm -hmm. like setting us up. Because you know, because we were, we knew we'd make each other laugh. He knew right. we'd make, each other laugh. and he. But also, he just thought Belzer was so, and he was. I mean, hilarious, hilarious. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, we met. You know, we fell in love, and you know, in comedy love, and uh, did started shickling immediately, and <laughs> it's great. Yeah, you know? that's great. So and is that a bunch of his HBO specials and co-starring on them with him? We did six of them. Richard Belzer shows, and I played his manager, Tom Leopold. Oh, and yeah. I was a writer, and I hired Larry Charles. Oh, from Seinfeld, from yeah. Seinfeld, way before Seinfeld. 
Sure, yeah, that's right awesome. On. Yeah, and that design, we had all these guest stars, and you know, it took place at Catch a Rising Star, and Belzer was the MC, and I mm -hmm. was the manager of Bel the club and in, in Belzer's career, and uh, it was great, you know. Oh, that's yeah, I'll have to look for that. I, 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 let me know if you find it. Yeah, I will. Um, so is that so then is that where you met? Were you did you meet Larry David when you were hanging around? No, uh, yeah. Yeah, I met Larry David. Um, so the, around, I'm doing it mostly. I'm writing, but I'm also going on. You know, still going back for on stuff I wrote. I would be acting, which was mm -hmm. my favorite way to act because I knew how to do it. Yeah, you know, it was more much more relaxing. My own stuff than you know, my gun smoke, ma. I gotta get out of this town. <laughs> <laughs> My Gunsmoke episode was like based on Glassman, the Glass Menagerie, a really dominating mother. And I was a, a guy that worked at the bank and my sister's beautiful sister. That one, and the mother was all like, you know, neurotic. Mm -hmm. It's a weird Western part. This is my yeah. chance to be in a Western and I'm playing that guy. You know? <laughs> but it was a big part, you know? Yeah. Um, and then you were, you were on the uh, show with ted knight too right you had a big part on it yeah oh, awful I and mean, i can't find that anywhere fortunately <laughs> played his son on six episodes and then he did the show that he was on for a couple of years with right how was ted knight great great right? yeah great he was really sweet That's very nice guy yeah uh i really haven't i've got very few stories of bad disappointing stars yeah which is you know, uh, yeah, really few, which is that, amazing, I guess. Since yeah, I'm that's good. So long. Yeah. So, so we jumped around a little bit, but the, the Larry David, you—that's how you met him. You were hanging out with at the clubs. Right, and... we were. We met doing a show called P Politically Incorrect way before Bill Maher did it. Oh, really? He just took over the name later. Yeah. And I forget who was on it, but but Larry was on it, and we became friends yeah, i thought it was hilarious mm -hmm. and uh i've come you know and so we became friends and we i think my wife and i set him up with a date this is before you know he'd broken up with his with his first wife mm -hmm. before she was even his first wife should have told should have told him something but anyway <laughs> what do i know but um it's true he proposed to his first wife because the plane was going through real turbulent weather <laughs> oh, did he ever use it on the show? I don't remember from the time I was there. I don't. I don't think Not so. The season I was there, but yeah. anyway, anyway. But um, so I did know him, and then he did, and then he showed, remember one time he showed me this little film that he did, and here's the moment I realized, oh my god, I didn't really know who I was dealing with. Mm -hmm. Did this little short film about a guy just like him doing going to a business meeting and then walking down the stairs, and while he's walking down the stairs, he's going, stop counting. Stop counting. Stop counting. He's like counting the stickers. He's mm -hmm. so neurotic. <laughs> and, I, and I forget what the rest of the whole thing was about. It wasn't about counting, but right. the fact that, that he was saying that to himself, I thought, oh, fuck. Yeah. That's really good. That one little, you know what I mean? It wasn't about, it didn't have anything to do with the plot or what was really going on. Exactly. Just, one moment he's going down the stairs, you see this really neurotic hit, <laughs> right? It's yeah. great. Yeah, it's really good. It's like a thing you kind of, and I thought, oh, wow. so anyway, so he did this thing with Jerry, and it was called the Seinfeld Chronicles. It was mm -hmm. just like a couple of episodes, a few episodes, six maybe. And they were on, and I said, oh, man, this is so great. I thought, oh, this is too funny. They're not going to let them get away with this. Mm -hmm. And he's calling me, and he says, they picked it up for 13 shows. Would you come out and write on it? I said, sure. And I had to get out of this other thing I was doing, which was really bad. Yeah. <laughs> he said, Hi, honey, I'm home. I'm not on Nickelodeon, but one of these things that's no longer even around. Right. Um, anyway, so anyway, that's how it happened. I went out there and we did the first full, we we're supposed to just do 13. And I said, mm. oh, my wife was pregnant with our first daughter, first child. But, oh, great. 13 episodes, you know. Yeah. Back into work, whatever. And it's just really, when they changed the night, it went kind of through the roof. It blew up, yeah. Right, but you're in these building all that you don't really realize it. Mm. And it was only it was the first time I ever got a taste of what it must be like to be a celebrity. Because I went to a party 
and it's been on and it kind of had a buzz going. And I went to this party and the woman, speaking of married with children, um, can you remember her name? She played the wife. Oh, uh, Katie Seagal. Yeah. Great, yeah. I said, I was at the party, and I said, oh, I really enjoyed it. She said, oh, no, she gave me, I heard you write for Seinfeld. She comes over to me for me. I go, yeah, but she's Katie Seagal. Right, know? <laughs> yeah. And she was all, I was like, you could tell she was like a little starstruck from it, you know, just reflected from the show, not me. Right. Um, and that's when I realized this, whole, this thing is yeah. surprising me it's because some... I, I, you know, uh, I thought it was great, but, you know, that kiss, usually the kiss of death, you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Too good. They're not going to, you know. So what was the, because the, I've talked to like Peter Melman and some other people, the writer's room on side. There when I was there. Yeah. Oh, really? The writer's room is completely different from like a regular sitcom, right? It's really, you're like, you're, you go to Larry and Jerry and pitch your idea. And then would they, they would write it out or would you? No, you'd write, you write the script, you know, mm -hmm. you pitch the idea, you knock it around with them. And, and uh, like, for example, um, one of the ones I wrote that people like uh, is the cafe, you know, right. Bible, yeah. bad man, right. And that was all what Larry liked is you bring him stuff that really happened to you. That was funny. Mm -hmm. And you knew, I knew enough to know then, Oh, this is funny. The, the, the dream cafe it was called. And, uh, Babu Bot and all that, and the IQ test, and we put those two together. Right. In one show, and I wrote the script, you know, and then they, you know, we all, then we tumble on it, you know, mm -hmm. this is what you know. And then Larry took it and put it his through, you know, his changes, and it was pretty much what it was. Yeah. You know? So the, that was both of those, the the cafe and both combined. My life, yeah. I once, uh, we, we had there's a little cafe opened on the corner. We lived in. I lived, I had this rent controlled apartment in the best street in Greenwich Village for like 25 years, and when I finally you know and I had it really kept me in show business, which is my advice to young artists: low overhead. Mm -hmm. I don't think about art, but keep your overhead low. I think, right. I can't tell you anything other than that. But um, one day this little corner store opened up, and it was called the dream cafe and it was like only four tables <laughs> two of which he would put out at six o'clock in the front so people walking by in the summer and mm -hmm. put candles out and he wore a short sleeve madras shirt but at night for the dinner service he would button the top button which made it like that was his after six wear you know yeah he, the haughty the hot was clientele and the, the people came you know the high, the hoi polloi, and the right. high people came. In. <laughs> thought he felt he owed them that, um, but nobody went in. And the menu was so extensive for this tiny place, you could see that it's just going to die so bad. <laughs> and then I'm being, a, you know, twisted. You know, I, I kept just I can't go in because if I go in, nobody else is going in. If right. I go in, I can't walk by the building. Then I'll have to always go in. <laughs> My wife says, go go in. I said, no, I can't. If I go in, I won't be able, because I had to pass it, get to the apartment. Mm -hmm. So, But I could see that as it was dying, this poor, sad, dying thing, he kept changing the signs in the window, like free coffee and dessert. <laughs> yeah. well, just each thing sadder, like to death, you know. And as sad as it was, it was great, you know. And uh, who knows what the real story was, but it closed, obviously. Mm -hmm. And I expected him to have signs up. Five of my family died in the boat. <laughs> <laughs> have pity. Oh, yeah. Somebody can, you know, I expected him to start speaking Yiddish. Mm -hmm. and ask for, for pity. Um, that's how bad it got. So anyway, that was one I thought was interesting. And and years ago, when I, when I was single and dating a, you know, series of almost beautiful women, <laughs> um, this one woman I dated gave IQ tests mm -hmm. and she wanted to give me one and I wouldn't ever take it because I don't want to find out I was even stupider than I thought, you know, <laughs> I wasn't, didn't do so well at the school at all, at all. Yeah. Was with like, the guy who would eat your Crayolas, you know, <laughs> girl, this girl behind me ate my, what, my paste. I was put with people, you know, they were like chained right. up in the workhouse at night. You know? <laughs> anyway. So the... <laughs> 
So I like you, how you keep going though. It's good. Oh yeah, th- yeah, thank you. Um, no, you're you're. I am enjoying it. Um, so then yeah, you're you're like pitching jokes on other people's scripts and stuff, but you're also credited with with the suicide, which is like the the first appearance of Newman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. I wrote that one. And that uh, where, yeah, go ahead. No, and that's based on a true story too, because in that apartment I spoke of, my wife and I lived in there when we first married. It's great mm. because we could live like kings because the rent was like two hundred dollars a month, you know. So we go to La Tess and have dinner, and, you know. Yeah. We could, it was so great, so uh, great rent control department. Um, when I finally left, I had been renting it to other people. We, we, you know, we didn't live there anymore, but I would always keep it you know mm-hmm. and uh finally the landlord said mr leopold you've been here 27 years so i see your name on television <laughs> you, you, let, you know it's rent controlled you know move out right. and i thought you know it was so lucky for me I, I will but i said i want the bathtub because it had the feet on it mm. and i wrote so many and i wrote my novels in that bathtub you know, I wrote so I would write in the everything in the bathtub, like the Marquis de Sade, you know. Yeah. Bleeding. <laughs> but um, so they said, okay, and they give me money, seven thousand, and we leave and the tub. And we put the tub in this house we had on out on Long Island. Mm-hmm. Kent house. And uh, yeah. <laughs> That's great. So, well, that that oh, so anyway, the suicide was well, my wife and I went away for Christmas and came back. And um, we started smelling this weird smell, like maybe a mouse died on the wall or something. You know, New York stuff, you know. Right. The typical thing. And it gets worse and worse. And finally, uh, I forget what. We had this neighbor. And Phantom of the Opera had just come out. And this guy played the Phantom of the Opera mm-hmm. all day long, all day long, for days, right? I'm of the opera. Yeah. Okay. And he was poor thing. He, you hear him leave and he lock he, he was crazy with the locking. Nine uh-huh. locks. And then three times, and then twice, and then tap his head and that. Yeah. Anyway, turns out it started to smell really bad. And I go next to I knock on the door and the door starts slides open. Long story short, he over Christmas his Wife had left him, and he blew his brains out. Oh, jeez. And we're smelling my neighbor. Yeah. So I don't go, I go, I, I see this, and I get hit with this smell. And uh, I get the super, and we go in. And poor guy, he's on the, he's about a day away. As the cop told me later, he was a day away from exploding. Jesus. You, know, you don't want to explode, you know? Right. <laughs> yeah, I know. Maybe I said that. You know, I'm getting to the age where I have to think about it. I want to be cremated, buried, or just explode. <laughs> explode. That's what I want to do. Right. You know, it's not big, you know? Um, yeah. So anyway, of course, me. And the truth is, because her apartment was rent controlled, after they buried him and everything, she moved back in. Yeah. <laughs> right. I'm not going to get a rent like that. No, yeah, yeah. you can't pass Your husband blew his brains out. Yeah, yeah. But still, <laughs> where are you going to get a deal like that? Wow. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's funny. Yeah, it's really, yeah. And um, oh, and the Drake's cakes were part of the. Oh yeah. The great thing about working, one of the great things was you know, just having been associated with it. But you could put stuff in the show that you wanted, mm-hmm. like Pez. We, <laughs> that's how we found out that. We did the show about Pez, you know, yeah. one of the shows that we did, Larry Road. We all pitched on and and then crates of Pez dispensers. <laughs> Just shit, you know. So we somebody liked um Drake's cakes. We put that in. Crates of Drake's <laughs> cakes. You know, so that we put that in the script. And that's what, you know, I forget if it's no, the Drake's cakes. We put in the script first, and then the Drake's cakes came mm. later. In. Running shoes, and just kind of right. Just, just anything you wanted. Lots of became about what we needed. You know? <laughs> um, so yeah, and the great thing about here's a great writing thing that great it is, but 
you know, the part of Newman was based on this guy that used to come over to Larry's apartment. And that apartment, before Larry ever did Seinfeld, I was in that apartment. And just like Kramer did live next door. Yeah. And he would just come in all the time. <laughs> oh, really? I wasn't, you know, he's, yeah, Kramer. Yeah. It's Larry's apartment. And um, anyway, so we, he wanted this Newman in, who was another guy that he knew or something. And it's so funny that casting is so important and so mm-hmm. lucky and so uh, an alchemy that you just, you don't rarely get, you know, but when you hear the guy, you know, you read somebody, all different people all day long, it's kind of like, um, and bang, and, you know, and that was Newman, uh, Wayne Knight. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The part of Newman and, and right there was Newman, you know? Yeah, you just knew. So it makes you look like you're brilliant. Right. <laughs> You know, yeah, the part's funny, but in the same with Babu Bhatt, he was great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Englishman. Uh, and he was hilarious. You know, so so um, then you start writing for the actor. Right. To that, play to their strengths. And yeah, you play, yeah. right, exactly. Like uh, when I was doing Cheers, um, they told me to start out, Kirstie Alley, may she rest in peace. For mm-hmm. Yeah. Very sad. Um, they didn't really find her character until it's one episode she had a cry, and she cried so funny. Mm-hmm. They started giving them their their character because she came in to replace. Uh, uh, Diane. Shall, yeah, yeah, really long, and um, so yeah, yeah. That was my point there. Well, play to play to actors' strengths. Oh yes, thank you, thanks. <laughs> uh, in the news. <laughs> So, so did you Mayberry report? <laughs> it's a Mayberry white paper. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I got to work you a little on the name. <laughs> no, I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, did you? So you went right from Seinfeld to Cheers. Yes. And how yeah. is how how are the two shows different? Well, Cheers, I loved Cheers. My well, it was my favorite place to work. Mm-hmm. Just because you're in a room, really, we're in a room all day long with every with five, six, seven of the funniest people. Right. Then there would be other people out doing first drafts and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, when Seinfeld was great, but it was all very new too. So it was, you know, it's just kind of, you know, a little tiny, small operation that Larry and Jerry really, you know, brought forth. Right. Sure. Um, but Cheers was like the Rolls Royce company had been on for years you know, and private chefs and yeah, you know, and they took all the writers out to Chasen's uh, before the season began. Mm-hmm. We, each writer had to say something to the cast. Oh, so really? They, you know, get up and make a toast and say something to the cast from the right. So I remember I it was that we had just met the cast and we were about to start writing. Just really, just a big dinner to welcome the new writers or to welcome everybody back at Chasen's, mm-hmm. which is the the tail end of old Hollywood, right? And I, I said, it, my thing, my toast was, is, is it, um, is this the wrong venue to ask for a little more money? <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't even started really starting. Maybe That's this, a good line. Yeah, that was it. But um, I really enjoyed that because I met some guys that are still very close friends who were just hilarious, hilarious. Yeah. Women, yeah. Yeah. And, That's- uh, but you're working for, you know, and you knew that with Cheers, same with Seinfeld, but you know, if you wrote a good joke, there's no way it, uh, those actors weren't going to get the center of the bat, you know. And just really, oh, yeah. Yeah, hit it, right. You know, you, you could just, and you knew too, because if they didn't get a laugh, it's on you. Right. <laughs> they, they knew what they were doing by that point, you know. Right, exactly. Yeah. That's yeah, that's it. That's interesting. Very yeah, interesting. Yeah. So you mentioned Paul Schaefer. I'm drinking my own urine. I hope it's not. <laughs> oh, that, yeah. well, it looks delicious. From six to seven, I drink my <laughs> own urine. And it tastes pretty bad. I'll be <laughs> with it. it smells bad too. But doctor's orders. So yeah. You mentioned Paul Schaefer. You tell me your, tell me your opening joke. My opening joke? Yeah. I need to stand up. <laughs> I go, uh, I, uh, let's get this out of the way. I don't smoke weed. Uh, oh, yeah. 
Oh, I saw you. I saw that line. Oh yeah, I yeah. You up and watch. Yeah, you're great. You're very oh, funny. thank you so much. Very good. Very good that. attitude up there. Oh, good, thank you. Good, good character. Good. Thank you. I appreciate you're doing that. great. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to see see what you did, and um, I want you to leave the business. <laughs> it's over. It's over. All right. <laughs> uh, just you're great. Well, thank All you. Right. Back to me. Let's bring it back. All right. <laughs> You mentioned Paul's. You're, you're hanging out with Paul Schaefer. You yeah. you wrote a with him a special. Viva yeah. Jay Vegas. Jay Vegas. Oh boy, that was fun. Jesus. Uh, well, Letterman was so hot at the time. Yeah, I'm a big Letterman guy too. So. Yeah, me too. Dave's yeah. great. I've written for him too. But, um, and Paul had been my best friend way before he ever did Letterman. You know. Yeah, so Jim. So you, how'd you meet him through like the lampoon and stuff? Through the the the, uh, the network. Yeah, uh, I, I met him at uh, in L.A. and he came up to me and rather insulted me and he, because there was this uh, at the time we were into just Jerry Lewis and how smarmy and, <laughs> and Sinatra and the Rat Pack, but also in love with that stuff too. Right, loving it, but also knowing on one hand but still wanting you know that stuff that made it at 12 13 these were our heroes you know yeah. if i ever thought i'd be writing with Jer for jerry lewis or or meeting lunching with jerry lewis or jonathan winters or all these heroes of mine yeah you know uh, great i have a great jonathan winters story who was really i guess made my all-time favorite but oh i'd love to hear that yeah yeah well um what we were we going for do we, can we want to hear that now Sure. Well, yeah, I was just asking about the the special you did with with Paul Schaefer. Oh, oh, let me tell you that one. That's a good. Yeah. One. Um, we we Harry Shearer, who part of Spinal Tap, and Harry and I were written wrote so many different things together. Yeah, I'd be on the radio show all the time. Yeah, Le Show. Yeah, Le Show. Right, many hundreds of times, and uh, so Paul wanted me and Harry and him to write the script, and we came up with this idea called Viva Shea Vegas. Paul Shea. And it was all about how she, it was basically Paul and my, our, my real life too. Like we were both had been bachelors for a long time and mm -hmm. you know, like to chase the gals, you know, and whatever. And um, so the whole plot was, should he marry his girlfriend now that he's big and famous, Hope Crosby. That was the name we gave the, his girlfriend, Hope Crosby. <laughs> and she said, you know, you don't care about me. You just love my name. You know, <laughs> <laughs> he said, I go, well, you know, yeah, but, uh, and should he get married? She gives him an ultimatum and he goes, he's been offered to do a Vegas show with topless dancers and stuff. I mean, you should see it. It's pretty, I love to see it. Yeah. Way ahead of its time, I think. And I play his, I play Tom Leopold at the pool. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I, I don't remember, but when he's the girl's friend is giving him shit, she goes, uh, okay, Paul, go to, how, go to Vegas and, and sleep with a stripper and because you don't want a life. You don't want a family. You don't want what let William Morris give you a 10 pound baby bouncing nothing. <laughs> Paul goes, Paul goes, honey, is that what this is all about? I'm not even with the Morris agency. <laughs> so then he goes out to Vegas and we've got Gene Pitney, who was one of our childhood heroes. Mm -hmm. He's a big singing star. And he did a song called Town Without Pity and we wrote a song, Viva She Vegas, Wah! you know, all that kind of 1960 stuff. You know, Where do you run to? Where are you running to? Viva She Vegas. <laughs> with lines like, you see a leggy blonde playing Keno with a come heather look in her eye. Her old man blew his brains out in Reno. <laughs> do you deal yourself in or pass by? Ah, Viva She Vegas. Buffets at midnight, starlight and Viva Shevana. You know, but <laughs> Gene Pitney sang it. I have the sheet music signed to. But anyway. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. So that's why this business, I've been so lucky. I, I love Gene Pitney and I ended up writing a stupid song that he sang, you know? Right. And, uh, but anyway, and I, and you see me and I'm, he, Paul doesn't know what to do. He gets to Vegas and it's dawn and he, just walks out by the pool and I'm the pool was completely empty except for me, Tom Leopold, screenwriter. And I'm in a white robe, my sunglasses, and I'm just reading the New York Times with my coffees. He goes, Tommy, Tommy Leopold. 
my chef, what are you doing here? Tom, I got a big problem. I said, let me get you a robe and some coffees. No, no, I'm, I don't want to. Okay, okay. So the, and he goes, Tom, what am I going to do? Do I marry Hope? or I, I go, I don't know, Paul. You know, I'm a screenwriter. I don't know that much about life. But I know a guy. We should, he's the guru. He'll tell you what to do. Sam Butera. Now, Sam Butera used to be the sax player for Louis Prima. And he was playing one in an unenclosed lounge. Tell me if I'm getting into, into the weeds here. No, no. Yeah. So we got to, he goes to see Sam Butera. You know, should I marry him? He goes, Paul, I don't know. I go, Paul, this is the guru, the Sam Butera. And he really had a he was great jazz player. And he goes, should I marry him? And he goes, Paul, let me ask you something. Are you regular? And Tom, Paul looks at me and goes, why is he asking me if I'm regular for? You know? <laughs> it's his only advice. Excuse me, I spit on myself. I laugh so <laughs> <laughs> Are you regular? Yeah, I'm regular, but what is that going to help me? You know, anyway, that's kind of a nutshell, the kind of stuff we were doing. And all that's these funny. celebrities were on it, Red Fox. And, oh, um, wow. Shit, a great Red Fox story. Oh, I'd love to hear it. I love Red Fox. We did this thing. Paul, Paul gets married on stage with all these topless showgirls. I mean, we get to Vegas. This is just going back a little bit. We get to Vegas, and we... We're, you know, I'm executive producing Paul Schaefer, Harry, Harry's directing. I wrote it, and you know, and I first day on the set, I go out and there's ten, like 10 girls, topless, star show girls. And Paul likes to bring, remind me of this fact that I had just gotten monogamous with my future wife mm -hmm. like a few days before. And then I fly, and I mean, my wife knows the story, right. But, and then I fly to Vegas, and there's all the top show. And one of the showgirls kept calling because I'm the executive producer, mm -hmm. calling my room. You know, <laughs> none of this would happen if I wasn't right doing the show or anything. You know, and and I could have. You know, I, Paul says you didn't wait three a week to get monogamous. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I know. No, no, no. Yeah, it's monogamous. <laughs> anyway, yeah, Capone, let me come into your room and give you a massage. No, that's all right. <laughs> Brie or whatever. <laughs> whatever, you know, but she plays a girl in there. So, but anyway, uh, yeah, so it was, we had so much fun. We yeah. Had it over Christmas and so the red, you're going to tell a red Fox story. Oh yeah. So Paul ends up doing his show and it's really funny. The show we put together and, uh, he has two guys in it, Carlo and Carlos, who I remember from a kid from seeing a variety show. There was just two guys wearing gold, like speedos, all bodies covered in gold, both of them. And they were just doing things where one brother would hold the other brother up like this. And then, you know, they poses and stuff. It was this kind of entertainment I had to watch when I was a kid, <laughs> like on the Ed Sullivan show, these right. weird acts that we, I love, you know, and we always go looking for it. But so we had these two guys, Carlo and Carlos. And one, you told them apart because when, on stage, one was more gold, but when they went out, the other one wore more gold paint on the whole body. <laughs> anyway, you have to see it. It's funny, but um, so anyway, at the end of it, Paul's girlfriend comes and they end up getting married on stage in front of and uh, Robert Goulet is best man or whatever. Or I'm mm -hmm. not whatever. And uh, and then the part comes where does anybody? Harry plays Rabbi Shlomo Lop. <laughs> Harry impersonated this rabbi that was so great with the whole thing, man, the payas and the big hat. Mm -hmm. Paula, Bali, is afraid like a hasana. He's very full, you know, uh, <laughs> hasidic stuff in Vegas. And there's topless showgirls standing there. And stuff. And this <laughs> rabbi, orthodox rabbi. And, uh, oh, man, and um, anyway, Red does anybody protest this wedding? You know, whatever that line is, people say. Mm -hmm. I do. Red <laughs> Fox. Red Fox stands up and get out of here, Red. You know, whatever. All right. So we shot the thing. And, uh, and then later in the day, there's a call. Tom, Red Fox is on the phone. He wants to talk to you. you know, I kind of handled Red when he got there. Right. And I go, really? Yeah. But this possibly payment problem. So I go, hey, Red, man, you were great. Ah, thanks, Tom. You know, he's listening. 
did anybody find a keychain that I lost, Tara? I go, what? It was kind of, well, it wasn't really a keychain. It was a little bottle on the end of it. So basically, Rand had lost, dropped his Coke. Yeah. <laughs> on, the, on the floor of the audience. He's doing his bit. He's calling me. I said, gee, no, Fred, but Fred, uh, Red, Fred Sam, Sam. But I'll let you know. Meanwhile, you know, me and everybody else just running to look for, for Red. <laughs> oh, you know, it's got to be great. You know? <laughs> right, yeah. But I just, that's, a, that's my Red Fox story. Where's that's, my keychain? That's very funny. I on it, you know. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Did you ever hear this the story that Bob Einstein was was working on Red Fox's variety show? Yeah. And uh he came out of the dressing Red Fox came out of the dressing room to, one time he had a bunch of uh white stuff on his nose and, and Bob goes, You got some you got some stuff on your nose there, and Red goes, Ah, it's those damn powdered donuts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, here he was like 65, you know. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Doing blows, dude. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Danny had a hard life. He was a great, funny guy. Yeah, very funny. Real innovator. His comedy albums were really famous. Oh, he yeah. Under the counter, you know? Yeah. You got to wash your ass was one. And it's just yeah, yeah. the donkey's tail up, sniffing the donkey's ass. Yeah. <laughs> well, party records back then. Party records. And you couldn't get them. You had to, like, you know, you had to get them kind of in the black market and stuff. I know, black, yeah. Black. They were uh, a whole kind of subculture of. Yeah, I love Red Fox. He's great. Bruce, you know. Yeah, Lenny Bruce. Yeah. Yeah, a bunch of great guys. Um, so oh, the Jonathan Winter story. Let's let's hear oh. that. Well, the way you felt about Dave, Dave, Dave Letterman is how I felt about Steve Allen when I was mm -hmm. growing. Steve Allen was one of my heroes, and yeah, I don't you know, young man. I sound like the old, I am the old guy, but. You know, you guys, too, he was great. He was really, really funny. And he had a great Don Knotts and people. Yeah, put around. Uh, Tom Post. And, yeah. yeah, and he was the wittiest, fastest, smartest guy. And I adored him, you know. And um, then I get a chance. I get hired to write. He gets six shows. It sounds like I used to parody these old comedy writers. We used to do a 15-minute show on the <laughs> Tupac Network. Things <laughs> nice. You couldn't build an audience. You know, Right. <laughs> Mind if I smoke? I got emphysema. I didn't relax. <laughs> anyway, but um, so we're doing six shows. And I was hired to write. Catherine O'Hara was hired to write. Oh, really? After I met Catherine. And he ended up putting us on our, his shows because we both started writing bits that we performed for him. And he put us on and was on big parts on all of the shows, too. I played Tom Leopold, comedy writer. Uh, we got your email. I, you know, I could, I could find it. It's one of the Steve Allen shows. Oh and, yeah. And I'm typing here, but talking to the camera over here the whole time. I'm writing a sketch for for Steve right now. That's pretty good. And <laughs> uh, I'm just my fingers are moving on the typewriter. Mm -hmm. um, oh, made a mistake. Anyway, but uh, so Catherine Harris. So anyway, I'll tell you how much we're running out of time. So I'll just tell you. I mean, I don't want to keep you, but. Um, <laughs> Um, the first day on this, I met, actually started working with Steve Allen. This is a pretty, I, 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 I think of it now and I go, where did I get the balls to do this or stupid thought to do this? But mm -hmm. he was really tall. He was like 6'4", you know, I'm 5'10". I'm standing next to him and we're, we're filming out on location at a movie theater, a sketch I wrote. And I'm standing with Steve Allen and I, I'm like, you know, it would be like you, you know, working with Letterman, you know. Right. You know, and and I'm standing next to him, and I hardly know him. I've just been really met him, and I, I'm just loved. I had so much love for him, and I'm so excited. You know, he had a round bandaid on his neck, like from a pimple, or maybe where he cut himself or something. Mm -hmm. Round bandaid, and I don't know what possessed me, but I just reached up 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 here, and I just put my finger on the bandaid right on his neck, and held it there, and I said, uh, Jane. Uh, Hold all of my calls. Have Fritz bring the car around and call the barbershop. Tell him I'll be down there. And, <laughs> and I want the shoes done. I want, you know, just left it there a really long time. Mm -hmm. and, did that. and he laughed his ass off and took me to his house. He ended up inviting me over for dinner. You know, this is my hero, right? 
Right. Anyway, because I could have been fired too. Yeah. You know, <laughs> but I love, it wasn't out of anything, but just wanting to connect, you know? Right. I don't think I would have done it now even, but anyway, <laughs> the Jonathan Winters story is a really sweet story. He knew I idolized Jonathan Winters too. And Jonathan came and did the show and she says, look, just stay with him the whole day because he'll wander away. Mm-hmm. You know, he's a great genius, angel, genius, funny, crazy thing. You know, John Winters ended up actually did time in a mental institution. Mm-hmm. Just if you've ever seen him, I know you must know him, but check him out. Everybody else. Uh, anyway, so I had to speak with Jonathan all day. I loved it. It was just, he couldn't stop doing bits, you know, like Robin Williams, but to me, the original, you know? Right. Yeah. Uh, then lunchtime came. He says, Tommy, let's go to lunch. Let's go to Musso's. So John the Winters gets in my shitty Volkswagen. We go to Musso and Frank's, the great grill, the great old Hollywood grill there from 1914 or something. Mm-hmm. And he's just do, just working for me. He's doing the whole, he's just nonstop different characters for me. And I, I'm thinking, to my, I'm 25, you know, 10 years ago. Before that, I was sitting on the carpet in front of the hi-fi listening to his comedy record. Right. Now every word yeah so anyway we we and i know it's getting late just one we gotta go back you know gotta shoot your thing so we go back and on the driving back he goes and tell me about you tell me he's asked me one question the whole, whole time tell me about your family i said well my son like one of four boys my mother grew up in miami and right now my older brother's in the hospital he has hodgkin's disease and he's really let's call him so we get back to the studio and the woman's out there waiting with the clipboard, telling them, you gotta go right to make it. No, no, wait, hold on. We go into this dressing room, we call Miami Beach, Mount Sinai Hospital. And uh, I get my brother on the phone, he's in the hospital with cancer. And both my brother and I knew every word of his records. We would just sit up with our ear against this hi-fi, big old monstrous piece of furniture, mm-hmm. listen to Jonathan Winter's records, and or all comedy records. And he gets on, and I, hey, Mark, um, Friend of mine wants to talk to you, Coach. And give me some name. Hi, Mark. How are you? This is Coach Wilson. This boy, get out there again. This rub dirt on his son. Get back out on the. You know, they did like ten minutes for my brother. Wow. And, uh, finally, they pulled him away. And but that's my beautiful Jonathan Winter story. Yeah, that's a great story. God bless him. Yeah, it yeah. was a beautiful story. That's amazing. Yeah. 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 That's well, I. Uh... I uh, don't want to take it up too much of your time, but I'd love to talk about the the musical you, your recent musical that you wrote with Richard Kind. Oh, oh wow, man! Thanks for even knowing about that. Yeah, yeah. I'm so proud of it. We're going to do it at the Triad Theater in um, January. We start up again. Oh, and, nice! Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely yeah, come see do, it. Uh, Richard Kind did it, and Jackie Hoffman. These two great, hilarious people. It's called Kip and Sylvia tonight on D Deck. And it's about the Glasscocks, Kip and Sylvia Glasscock, a husband and wife songwriting team who just hate each other and they're <laughs> horrible, horrible people. And I wrote the songs. The songs are good, I think. And it's just about they, they've reunited to perform on their shitty cruise liner that was the old Concordia. I don't know if you ever heard of it, but the Concordia was an Italian cruise liner that crashed, that the captain put went and had a smoke and the whole cruise liner went into a rock. <laughs> 500 people died. He went to jail. Well, <laughs> Mike, you hear the cop, you hear the, hello, this is your captain. It's wonderful to be out of jail. Uh, <laughs> moment to pause for the loss of life. Okay, now I'm with the show, Kip and Sylvia. And Kip and Sylvia talk about their lives and what was behind each one of these songs, like Fat Lady at the Dance and different things. And they're just vile, horrible people. <laughs> like finding we keep hitting this vodka while he's not looking and getting kind of really belligerent <laughs> and it's it's and Richard Kind and Jackie Hoffman were so great and we're going to do it up in um January starting January 16th at the Triad Theater in New York unless we have to move it because we have to get a, a new cast in mm-hmm. uh, we we think we have them because Richard's doing a series yeah but uh, people are eager to do it so and I'm um, thrilled it sort of caught on and uh yeah, Kip and that's, Sylvia. Yeah, that's great. I I'd love to come see it. Yeah, man. Yeah, well, you gotta come see it. Stay yeah, in touch. I, I would definitely will. I want to come see you do your act. Oh yeah, I'll let you know. Yeah, definitely. All right, that'd be I, awesome. I keep, I keep rooms at the city. We keep rooms. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Yeah. 
Awesome, man. Uh, yeah. I'll last question. We'll wrap on the up on this. Um, be good. <laughs> what's the best piece of advice you'd give so, to someone that's just starting out in comedy? Yeah, or writing or showbiz, or- just showbiz in general for comedy. Yeah. Um. Make sure you think it's funny. Mm-hmm. Not what you think they're going to like. Right. Um, it's really got to make you laugh. Yeah, exactly. Really. Yeah. Because let's say you got to do it. It's successful and you have to keep doing it. That's the only way you'll, that's the only, well, you'll, you'll know how to go to that. Well, mm-hmm. right. And also that's the big only chance for really having a voice. I don't know. I'm not the only chance, but you know, building your voice for yourself. And uh, uh, because none of us are so original that if we really think it's funny, there won't be a lot of other people who think it's funny. We're not right. wonderfully, you know, you know, special. That's what's great. That's a great thing to know. So better to go down with stuff you really think is funny because ultimately it probably is. And it might just be different. And that, and also, you know, it might take a while, Mm -hmm. but also if you stay with what you really makes you laugh that you think of, and that's when you'll start finding your character on stage. Yeah. And you gotta have a, I don't say you have to be different than you are, but you know, the version of yourself, it's really, they want to know who that person is, what your character is, you know? Right. Not your character, but you know what I mean? Like, yeah, no, I get it, yeah. Who's sort of the guy behind the shovel, you know? And if exactly. you stay with just your, what really makes you laugh, you know? That's what Norm MacDonald said. Oh, Norm, with. yeah, Norm's my yeah, favorite. He didn't give a damn if he bombed. Yeah. You know? He probably enjoyed it. You know? <laughs> I think he did, yeah. But yeah, he's my all-time favorite. No, um, I, I really only really got into him after he passed. I worked with oh, him. Oh, really? Thing, but I, I now I could kick myself because I mean I realized what. Where did you work with him? Dave Letterman. I wrote all. I used to write on all the Mark Twain awards. Oh yeah, yeah. Washington Kennedy Center, honoring different famous funny people. You know, and the year we did Dave Letterman, uh, Norm came and yeah. Uh, Honored him with, a, with some jokes, you know. And um, and I now remember sitting there watching him really be in pain. I don't mm. know, maybe he pulled his back out or something, or because I had to go. I was writing, and I was uh, Norm. I said, "It's absurd," but I'm here. I'm a front writer. Not that you need me, man. Yeah. And he did, and he was great, and he's lovely. And, but um, why we talk about Norm? And I forgot. Uh you oh he he's. You just said he knew his voice and Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I shouldn't have gotten so high before the call. <laughs> <laughs> I've enjoyed it. But um yeah, so I mean, you know, talk about it. There's there's someone to emulate. I and mean, if you already love him, you know, you know that it was stuff that he really thought was funny. Exactly, yeah. You know? And was funny. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for doing yeah, this. That's I, my I, advice. I think that's good advice. Yeah, it's a great advice. Well, I'll have to, I feel like we've barely scratched the surface. I'll have to have you on again. Anytime. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, Tom. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Trent. (laughs) Thank you. Just say, and that's all for tonight. I'm Trent Mabry. I'm Trent Mabry, and that's all for tonight. There you go, buddy. Very (laughs) good. That's it. That's your hook. Hey, baby, I hear the blues are calling. Toss salads and scrambled eggs. Mercy. And maybe I seem a bit confused. Yeah, maybe. But I got you pegged. <laughs> but I don't know what to do with those tossed salads and scrambled eggs. They're calling again. Scrambled eggs all over my face. What is a boy to do? Mabry has left the building.